we used to always think about climate change as this environmental issue that would have effects at some point in the future. Like the Kyoto Protocol doesn't have the word people or communities or women or anything with, you know, limbs other than maybe a tree. And now, because of all these connections that these new NGOs made to make sure that they could get into the climate space and be recognized, it's like putting a human face on climate change. Hello, welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast, Season 2, Global Ecopolitics. This is a podcast for university students tackling some of the big questions in the field of global environmental politics. I'm Ryan Katz-Rosine from the University of Ottawa, and my co-host for the show is Dr. Peter Andre from Carleton University. Peter, can you set up today's episode? Sure, thanks, Ryan. On today's show, we're delighted to be speaking with Dr. Jennifer Allen of Cardiff University about global ecopolitics during and after the COVID-19 pandemic, including current discussions about the idea of a Green New Deal. Uh, this is a topic, by the way, that we also touched on in season one shows with uh, Paul Pelkey and Sherilyn McGregor, and we're looking forward to getting into it in more depth today with Jennifer. We'll also talk with Jennifer about the role of environmental social movements, particularly international non-government organizations, uh, or ENGOs, if you put the E in front there, which makes up an important part of these social movements and how they shape in international environmental policies uh, like the Paris Accord and others. So we have a lot to talk about with Dr. Allen, and I'm just going to go right ahead and jump into our first questions. Jennifer, welcome to the show. I'm wondering if we can start with you telling us a little bit about your involvement in one of these international uh, environmental non-government organizations, which is the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Specifically, I uh, believe you've been working with the Earth Negotiations Bulletin, which is uh, connected to the IASD. And this is um, a reporting service that reports on what is happening and analyzes what's happening in international environmental negotiations. You're the second guest that we know of who's worked with the ENB. And I wonder if you can tell us a bit about what the ENB is about and your experience working there and how maybe that shaped your interest and research trajectory in global environmental politics. Sure. Uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, you probably have had other EMBers. We're a pretty big network uh, over the years because it's been going since, uh, gosh, almost 28 years now. So the, the whole idea of the EMB is that there needs to be more transparency in global environmental governance because these meetings happen and countries send their delegates and then decisions are made. And often some of the people most affected by those decisions, well, they aren't there. So that was one of the first kind of reasons for having the EMB is to tell civil society and communities and even government actors that are at home that will have to implement these decisions, what on earth was going on and what their countries were saying on their behalf. Over the years, we've realized that there's a second really important reason for the EMB, and that's countries have different capacities when it comes to negotiations. So some countries will have three or four or five delegates, but the problem is for something like a global climate negotiation, there might be 10 negotiations happening all at the same time. And so until we figure out how to clone people, uh, those delegations, those countries, just can't be effectively represented. And they won't know what discussions were happening across all of those rooms, all those negotiations. So the EMBs really become a tool for those smaller delegations, usually from developing countries, uh, to keep on track of what's happening in negotiations and to be able to more effectively participate. That's really useful, uh, Jen. And I'm wondering, you know, you, you mentioned climate negotiations, and that's the example that, that we hear a lot about these days. But we're wondering, you know, what are some of the um, environmental issues that, uh, that ENB has covered that don't deal with uh, climate change? Yeah, it's true. It's climate, climate, climate these days. And, and, and for very good reasons. I mean, it's extremely important. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm one of those people that tries to fly the flag for a few other causes. 
Um, so I have been to negotiations for chemicals and wastes. Uh, so some chemicals, for example, are almost rewriting, you know, the climate is rewriting our planet, but some chemicals are rewriting our bodies in a way. Uh, they're affecting our hormonal systems, our intellectual development in some cases. So, I mean, there's really important issues that we have to address uh, and some wastes will be with us for generations. Um, EMB also covers forests and biodiversity and desertification. Uh, some of the science bodies like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, or its biodiversity sister, the IPBES. Uh, basically, EMB does almost all of the global environmental negotiation processes. Uh, most of them we've covered since the very beginning as well. That's very cool. But okay, I'm going to bring it back to climate now. I'm wondering, since you have covered a range of these uh, agreements, and I think you've also covered specifically some uh, negotiations on climate, I'm wondering if you can tie this back to some of your recent work on NGOs. You published a book last year uh, called The New Climate Activism, NGO Authority and Participation in Climate Change Governance. So, uh, I mean, it's clear, I think uh, you, you've you developed a really uh, keen uh, understanding of what's happening behind the scenes at these uh, negotiations, particularly when it comes to the role of NGOs. So I'm wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about your book um, and, you know, why is it that some NGOs have become successful uh, in linking their various causes to the climate movement where uh, others may not have been so successful? Yeah, absolutely. The The idea for this book, I'll just tell you a little story, uh, was it kind of hit me in 2013 and I was with EMB. I was walking into the negotiation venue. We were in Warsaw. Uh, so the venue was the National Football Stadium or for North Americans, the soccer stadium. Uh, and, you know, I was walking in sort of for a, for a late night shift and someone dressed as a polar bear handed me a condom. And on it said, use this to save the planet. And so that was kind of strange. I mean, you see polar bears around negotiations. Oh, sorry. You see people dress like polar bears <laughs> around the negotiations quite a bit. Uh, but not usually trying to link population. And then I realized that there was gender day where we were encouraged to wear pink or red. And there was youth day and... There were NGOs representing all sorts of issues at the climate negotiations. And I started doing a little bit of looking when I got home from, from Warsaw. And I realized that most of these groups hadn't been there before. Or if they had been there, they were sort of recent additions, like maybe since the mid-2000s. So this kind of started me on, on the, the research project that led to the book. So I tracked what NGOs uh, were attending global negotiations and global climate negotiations. And I found this trend of about, you know, between 2000, 2005, and especially kind of picking up 2007, that you saw the civil society, like the NGO presence, just diversify. And there was people representing all sorts of issues from cities to indigenous peoples to development and women's rights and workers' rights. And you just saw this splintering into many different issues. And it really started to show that climate change wasn't just an environmental issue anymore. And so I started to track these, like the trajectories of some of these groups. And some of them were trying really hard to be recognized. For example, public health NGOs but they kind of were being ignored and lost in, in the shuffle. And so the ones that were successful, they, they kind of had three main advantages. The first was that they could make a link between their issue and climate change that everybody in their network could get behind. So you didn't see a lot of competition. You saw them linking to something very specific and saying, look, gender matters for adaptation. Women are disproportionately affected by climate change. And by linking to something specific, 
negotiators in the climate arena could also more easily work that in to the discussions rather than just saying gender matters for everything. The second thing they had was allies. So inside the climate negotiations already, there were actors that were willing to help these newcomers uh, kind of get oriented in the new space, find other allies, find rules. Uh, you know, it's a weird kind of social environment, the climate negotiations. So kind of provide these introductions. So the UN Environment Program, for example, really helped labor unions in the early days. And then the third thing they had was they could find kind of a, a foothold in to some of the rules that govern how NGOs are supposed to act in this space or how they access the space, like the negotiations. So for some, they could say, well, we're a major group, according to the Rio Earth Summit's Agenda 21. Therefore, we should have special status as an NGO in the climate negotiations. So labor and gender, they were able to do that. Uh, the climate justice movement didn't really have that. So instead, they argued that the Climate Action Network they don't represent all environmental NGOs. They only represent maybe about 11, 14% of them. So why do they get all those benefits? So they split that constituency into Climate Justice Now and Climate Action Network. So they kind of found their own way in. So those three resources were really helpful for them. That, that's really fascinating. So, so, you know, on your analysis, would you say that these, you know, civil society writ large, and, you know, you talked about a lot of NGOs that aren't specifically environmental NGOs, they deal with a whole range of issues. Is it fair to say that civil society is having a, a role, a, perhaps even a powerful role, a major role in shaping uh, climate governance today? Or, or is it uh, the case that maybe states and corporate players are still kind of dominating the, the, the tone and direction of the discussion? I think NGOs, especially these NGOs and social movements, have done something really remarkable in the climate space, that they have transformed our thinking about climate change. So now we view it as fundamental to our society, that we're all implicated in this now. And I think it's it's really done a lot to kind of empower movements. Um, I think it's done a lot to kind of bring awareness to the issue and bring, like create big coalitions. Um, more specifically, like now we do actually have negotiations about gender and climate change. Um, so there are kind of specific rules around these issues. I think the fundamental thing is that these NGOs have just transformed what we view climate change as and how important it is to our everyday lives. This is uh, really interesting, Jennifer. I, I feel like we've just done a circle where we started by talking about how there are a number of environmental issues besides climate. You mentioned uh, trade and hazardous waste and chemicals, for example, that deserve attention alongside the climate issue because they're so important to what's happening to the environment and to people. Um, and now we're talking about climate and climate uh, negotiations and how organizations that are working on a wide range of other issues have been able to bring their issues into the climate discussion. So these, these political dynamics are, are constantly shifting. It's really interesting. Um, and now I, I want to turn to uh, something, a, a big wrench that has just uh, been thrown into, well, that might be one way of looking at the, the climate politics, which is COVID. Um, you know, it kind of uh, came on us in the last year. Uh, some some would say as a big surprise. Others would say this. we might have predicted that this was going to be coming, something like this. But nonetheless, here we are in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic as we record this. It seems like there was growing momentum around addressing climate change after Greta Thunberg's trip by boat to the Americas to participate at the COP26 in Chile. And now we, we can't really gather and we can't have these mass manifestations that show politicians how much this issue is important to people um, at a time when it seems like the climate movement is especially needed to make that point. 
Can you tell us a bit about how do you see what's happened to this movement in the context of the pandemic? How has COVID impacted the discussions? Has the conversation shifted from the streets into the digital realm? What, what, what do you think's happened? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing, there's many things that this pandemic has certainly affected and, and the ability to mobilize is a big one. There have been a few small demonstrations here or there. Uh, currently, right now, since I'm speaking to you from, from the UK, uh, there are some protesters that are occupying a site where a large high-speed rail network is supposed to be put in. Actually, they dug tunnels underneath it. Uh, so there is pockets of activism still happening. But we can't get 50,000 people together like, the people that marched through the streets of Madrid at the last climate negotiations meeting in, gosh, 2019 already. So it's a, it's tried to move online, but that's just very different. You know, you don't get the same feeling of camaraderie and togetherness as you do when you're shoulder to shoulder with strangers and friends alike. So COVID has really hurt that. It's also hurt any efforts of kind of as you say, putting pressure on governments, because this is just such a crucial year for climate change. The Paris Agreement started working in 2020, and countries were encouraged to submit uh, updated pledges to the Paris Agreement. And very few countries did, especially very few major emitters. And then there was this climate summit that brought together 42 uh, additional kind of pledges and promises of all types, but very few of those, if any actually, resulted in a formally submitted pledge to the agreement. And so now all those are late. Uh, so we need that pressure more than anything right now, and it just is next to impossible to do. So, I mean, I think if there's anything to take from this right now, it's a Activism is an incredibly creative space, and I'm sure that there are ideas brewing. Um, it's just kind of waiting to see what those might be, because the digital space doesn't really put pressure on governments in the same way that large protests or maybe even civil disobedience might. Because you've spent a lot of time looking at the climate movement, I wonder if you can give us some more examples that um, give us a sense of the effectiveness of the movement and, and how it has been effective. You've already talked a bit about how it, the, the climate justice movement in particular has been transforming the narrative. You've talked about how various NGOs have piggybacked onto the climate issue to point out how gender, for example, is really important to climate adaptation. What are some of the other ways that you've seen this movement have an impact in recent years? I think there's a few. Like We have seen the movement impact some of the rules of the Paris Agreement, especially mobilizing for things like 1.5 degrees as the goal. Uh, I mean, it's interesting, that one, because the Paris Agreement doesn't say 1.5 degrees is the goal. It says uh, I'll get some of these words wrong because it's very long-winded, but it's something like uh, limit global temperature rise to two degrees and pursue all efforts to stay well below 1.5. But now we only talk about 1.5. Everyone from NGOs to UN Secretary General Gutierrez, we only talk about 1.5 degrees. And I think NGOs have been really a key set of actors in that one. Uh, I think they've also brought new tactics to how we protest for climate and how we uh, advocate for or try to pressure governments on climate change. It used to be that most climate activists were, I mean, I guess kind of insiders, like they would provide technical expertise to design a market mechanism or maybe they would you know, dress up like a polar bear or something like that. You didn't really see them getting out on the streets as much. And then when the climate justice movement showed up, a lot of those folks had their roots in the anti-World Trade Organization movements. 
And they knew how to protest and they knew how to do civil disobedience. And they brought that toolkit to climate change. And now we see Extinction Rebellion doing similar things where, you know, it's civil disobedience and it's causing disruption in the name of the global climate. And even, you know, Fridays for Future uh, and Greta Thunberg's movement having mass protests for climate is also something that, you know, even before like 2009 didn't really happen. So I think that's another way that, that these NGOs have been really influential is by bringing a whole bunch of new kind of tactics in, in expanding the toolkit of activism for climate change. These are really uh, good examples, Jennifer, um, both about how the NGO movement and its protest tactics has perhaps uh, changed and evolved and how that's shaping public discussion over climate. Um, and then you've provided examples where either these movements are influencing texts like what's in the Paris Accord or maybe how it's interpreted, you know, the example of the 1.5 degrees. Um, I wonder, you know, some of your students, some of our students are, are skeptical sometimes about like, how does that then translate eventually to kind of shifting a civilizational path, our energy mix, how we use land, how we live, um, how we relate to one another. And I wonder if, you, you know, you can just kind of, what are the links between what a movement does to protest and influence what happens in an international conversation and the changes on the ground in how we live and commute and so on that actually start um, reducing uh, greenhouse gases and get us towards this uh, idea of net zero by 2050? Yeah, just a small question. Just a small question, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and on that very small question, um, I don't even think you'd get the same answer from different people in the climate movement. Uh, some of them would say, you know what, we're here to show everyday people how they can be a bit greener, you know, cutting down on some meat, uh, commuting with public transit, using less plastic, for example. Uh, you know, we're here to show that climate change matters for everyone and everyone matters for climate change. And then you'd have some like Extinction Rebellion that would say, I don't care if you recycle, because the problem is the oil companies pumping out more unrecyclable plastics. So it's this debate that always exists on so many environmental issues. Is it about the system and the system in terms of market forces, in terms of concentrations of power, or is it about everyday people making changes because they want to live a little greener? Uh, and some movement, some parts of the movement are going different directions on that. But it's sort of this fault line that exists down the middle. Um, and so in some ways you can see, like there was a, a paper out recently about the Greta effect, which tried to suggest that maybe people who are more aware of Greta Thunberg uh, lived a little more environmentally friendly. Um, I think you could probably also argue that people that tended to live a little more environmentally friendly were a bit more aware of Greta Thunberg. So there might need to sort of, it, let's put it this way, that's a great paper for anyone in a methods class. <laughs> uh, but some of them really are putting the pressure on fast fashion and banks. And I think actually the interesting thing there is it's where those two sides of that fault line come together. So putting pressure on fast fashion has actually led to a huge amount of public awareness about the fact that fast fashion is one of the top three greenhouse gas emitting sectors in the world. Uh, so my students want to write and talk and think about fast fashion and its environmental impact in a way that they didn't want to do and it wasn't on the radar even just three or four years ago. So it's this interesting sort of unintended consequence of, of focusing on some of these big systemic players and problems and the fact that really most change, especially on environmental issues, but on others, uh, is elite driven change. So by focusing on that, some of these movements have actually done the opposite and encouraged people to buy, you know, less fast fashion and, and less disposable clothing. That's a really uh, interesting example. I've also noticed the rise of uh, papers in my courses on the fashion industry, 
and um, and how interesting it is that when those students then look for, so what's the multilateral agreement that deals with this issue? Um, they sort of hit a bit of a wall and it shows how, yeah, the conversations in the public sphere and among young people are maybe ahead of uh, where some of these international conversations are at. Um, on this question of, of uh, the, the sort of dualism between individual change and sort of collective action, um, you know, often driven by the public sector working with the corporate sector in some combination. Uh, how do you feel about that dualism? Because it sounds like you think that these two, these are two sides of the same coin. I do in a lot of ways. And I have to admit, I'm going to not have a great answer for you because I struggle with this every day. You know, I, I struggle with going to the grocery store and having everything just coated in plastic. The UK is so much worse than Canada for this. And then at the same time realizing I could cut down all my plastic use and, you know, stick myself with uh, the, the few fruits and vegetables that aren't covered in plastic. But then it, I would ultimately not be making much of a dent here. Uh, so it's, it's something I struggle with and it's something I struggle with in my teaching as well. And I, I think that most of it is that we have to push for the big systemic changes, uh, especially on things like climate change and uh, and on plastics particularly, and certainly on something like chemicals. There's very little I can do to reduce the body burden of chemicals because I was born with some toxic persistent chemicals in my body, like we all were, and because some of these chemicals are used without any labeling or without any knowledge on the part of the consumer. So for some of these big issues, it has to be that there has to be some form of change towards restructuring the incentives and making sure that using up environmental resources and then polluting the, environmental, the environment afterwards isn't cost free, uh, that there are real sort of changes that have to be made at a structural level. Um, but at the same time, we can't abolish individual responsibility. And it's, you know, you mentioned COVID. It's kind of a similar analogy in that we want people to stay at home and self-isolate if they are potentially infectious. But if that person needs to make a living, they can't do that necessarily. And so we need to create incentives that help people do the right thing. So with climate change, if we could make it easier and create incentives for people to do the right thing through better public transport, through uh, working from home, all sorts of things that people could do, then I think people would actually do it. You just can't make it difficult and annoying and sort of something that only us hippies do. Uh, it has to be, you know, we have to help people do the right thing. And the way to do that is thinking about smart structural change. Well, you said you, you didn't have a good answer for, for us uh, on that question, but uh, I would counter that it is a good answer. And, you know, I struggle with that. And I'm sure Peter does too. I think we all struggle with, with um, coming up with a nuanced uh, answer. And ultimately we have to, right? Because this is, it's it, the, the way that question is presented and maybe we take some responsibility here, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's, uh, it's often this like collective or individual. And, and I think uh, your answer points out that that's maybe too simplistic uh, a way of looking at it. Um, I do want to bring it back to, to COVID and, and end up our episode talking about some of the post-COVID recovery, which is another area of your, your research. But I, I have to ask a, a, a quick question about something you said. You mentioned, you know, there's environmental protesters occupying a high-speed rail project. And as you know, here in North America, there's a fairly common sense notion that you know, high-speed trains are what we want. High-speed trains are good for the environment, quote-unquote good for the environment. Um, and this is an example I often, uh, I, I do like to speak to my students about. So can you just tell us, you know, what what's compelled environmental activists in the UK to occupy a high-speed rail project? Yeah, this has been such a learning curve for me moving here because uh, I had the same idea when I came here. Like, oh, great, yes, high-speed rail that will link the northern part of the UK uh, well, northern, sort of Manchester, 
to London. Like, that's brilliant. Of course, people could go between them much more easily, fewer people in cars. I mean, there are some people saying, yes, there's, this is good for the global climate, right? It'll reduce emissions. Um, but a lot of environmental protesters are pointing out that this is going to damage several endangered habitats and ancient woodlands, uh, even a few of them that are internationally listed as sort of areas of special biodiversity. This is going to literally train right through them. Uh, it's also creating disruption for a lot of communities because some smaller communities are actually being asked to move. So some houses are being bought to make room for the, for the train or for some of the stations. Uh, there's also concerns that it might not actually reduce emissions because it's going to help link up some big airports. So you could fly into Manchester, but you say you live in London, take the train down to London. And so it might actually make international travel easier, which could increase our emissions. So it's it's really this thorny, thorny issue of you know, how this thing was cited, the fact that it's massively overrun costs already. Uh, the developer is saying that they're going to plant, I think it's 7 million trees to make up for all the ones they cut down. Uh, and they're doing an experiment with one of the ancient woodlands where they're, I mean, actually quite literally scooping the whole thing up and they're going to try to replant it all. Like they're even taking the original soils they're making sure that the same animals are coming. Uh, it's this relocation project on a scale that's never been tried before that they're, the developers are saying, look, we're protecting this ancient woodland. But several ecologists had said, well, I mean, this ancient woodland grew up in this place and this very specific kind of area for a reason. Um, you, know, you can't just scoop it all up and hope the microbiome, for example, comes with you. So it's, yeah, it, it's really kind of overturned and complicated my view as a North American coming over of, yes, more rail. We need more rail. Yeah, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, uh, I should state my bias here. I, I actually wrote my, my PhD about the environmental political economy of high-speed rail in Canada, or at least you know, failed efforts to bring high-speed rail to Canada. Uh, and I really hope somebody's writing a PhD about uh, about that um, in the UK context, it's quite quite amazing. Uh, but I do have to bring it back to COVID. So you know, many of these meetings that are supposed to occur within the the, the realm of multilateral environmental governance have either been postponed or they've just gone virtual in some instances. But there's a number of limitations involved in in trying to shift a, a large conference to the virtual setting. And you know, there's this also this question of like, how do how do civil society groups, the ones that you've been studying at these environmental negotiations, like how do they participate in in a virtual uh, plenary? Uh, but anyway, I'm just kind of curious to hear your sense on the COVID impact on the way we meet and the way we organize conferences and and, and the way countries are participating in multilateralism today. Is this something that is going to be sustained after COVID? Are we going to see fundamental differences uh, in the way that multilateralism occurs? Or do you think we're going to kind of go back to just a business as usual, so to speak, way of, of uh, putting together these uh, big international environmental agreements? It is really a, a terrible, sad irony that the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, has the largest climate footprint or carbon footprint of any UN body or agency. Everybody needs to go. It's this must-do event on your calendar. Uh, you know, upwards of twenty to twenty-five thousand people show up, uh, and most of them aren't local because it's a traveling circus. Sorry, it's a traveling important event that uh, happens in different countries every year. It rotates throughout the five UN regions. So there has been questions raised, like maybe all this experience that we're gaining with online forms of multilateralism could help us with this footprint problem. But I think really it's very, very limited. Uh, the only bodies that have actually met virtually and taken some decisions have been small bodies with maybe 30 members or so with a very defined mandate and a very defined set of tasks. 
anything bigger than that or anything where you're really doing kind of negotiation in the pure sense of coming up with new rules that hasn't happened online because developing countries have refused and they refuse not to be stubborn but for very good reasons like these online meetings tend to be organized around North American or European time zones so China for example would be up in the middle of the night trying to negotiate uh, internet problems have caused I mean just delays across all the online meetings I've gone to in the last year where you can't hear someone or they drop off the call uh, also UN meetings have uh, official languages where there's simultaneous interpretation happening and there's only a couple programs that are capable of doing that and they're all still pretty glitchy so there's a whole bunch of sort of equity and access issues that lead developing countries to say wait we are not comfortable with negotiating new rules online so I think in the future we might see some of these smaller bodies you know, maybe alternating between online meeting and an in-person meeting. But I think the big sort of rule-making ones, like a like the COP, for example, the big annual one, that one I think we're going to continue to see people flying from all over the world. Um, I think the COPs are actually going to get smaller in the future just because the Paris Agreement is adopted. There's a few rules still to negotiate, but I mean, I personally view them as sort of tempests in a teapot. Uh, so, you know, there isn't as much to do there. So I think the media will go less often. NGOs might kind of lose interest a bit. Uh, countries won't need giant, you know, hundred plus people on their delegation, some of them. So, you know, I think there will be sort of a natural curve where some of these cops will get a bit smaller, but probably that's not COVID related. That's a really interesting answer, uh, Jennifer. Um, and on just continuing this uh, this COVID path for a, sort of a last set of questions, um, there's been a lot of talk about a just green recovery post COVID. Um, but historically, we've seen that post recession recovery, say after the global financial crisis, resulted in the largest single year uh, emissions hike in emissions ever. So, how do we ensure that this time the recovery is truly green and truly just? Um, I know you've written on the idea of net zero COVID recovery. What are the prospects of a COVID recovery that also addresses climate change issues and some of the ma other major environmental concerns that you've discussed today? I mean, I think there is a huge potential here, um, especially because we're also thinking through a lens of what's just. And that's new from the last time that we were arguing for a green recovery. Um, so even things like one of the options that we came up with or that we analyzed was improving broadband. And that might sound kind of silly until you realize a lot of people have been working from home and have shown that we can do it. And so that reduces all of us, all the emissions related to all of us sitting in vehicles waiting to get to work. Uh, and it could help with allowing people that live in some parts of the country to have a job in, say, a metropolitan center because they don't need to pay high rent and commute in. So there are there's a lot of things that you wouldn't necessarily think of as a green recovery option that could be a green and maybe even just recovery option. I think there's also potential because I hope, and I see some signs of this, that the old conversation around either you have the environment or you have jobs and it's one or the other, I think that's finally starting to dissipate. And politicians from across the spectrum, right to left, have been realizing that green technologies, green initiatives, whether it's uh, installing renewables or upgrading the electricity grid or creating nature-based solutions to protect from floods, all of those create jobs. And they create high-skilled jobs and they create entry-level jobs. And so if you need to create jobs quickly, 
And if you need to create jobs that can't be outsourced, you know that you're creating jobs in your country, environmental projects can do that. And there's a growing recognition of that by a lot of key economies, including here in the UK, that there wasn't in 2008, 2009. The, the part that gives me pause on this, as much as I'm a cheerleader, is that I know that habits and status quo and doing what seemed to work last time is a really powerful force in policymaking. And so that's why, you know, again, it's difficult to mobilize, but even think tanks and politicians in the UN keeping up this conversation of a green recovery is so important. Because, you know, banks, uh, especially, say, central banks and central bankers, they're, they're not the most risk acceptant people, to put it mildly. They're going to look to what worked in 2008, 2009 and say, can we do that again? And the global climate can't afford them to do it again. We can't lock in more emissions by building fossil fuel plants. But we can really leverage this as an opportunity for a timely, tailored spend in green technologies, in green resilience building, uh, and in other activities that will allow us to live greener lives. I, I think those are great answers. And, and I think you're right on, on both fronts, that there is going to be a bit of path dependency um, that uh, these conversations really have to try and minimize. Uh, in terms of those those big spend uh, dirty projects that might be part of the COVID recovery in some places, um, but I your your other point I think is right on as well. I, I've been following environmental politics for a number of years now, and I feel like the conversation about how to create economic benefit and environmental benefit and now social benefits at the same time through certain kinds of investments. Um, I think I think you're right that that nut has finally been cracked to a large extent, and it's uh, you know I'm hoping that we're moving past the uh, economy versus environment uh, debates that uh, slowed so much of this thinking down for uh, the last couple of decades. I just want to uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Jennifer. And you know some of it's been a, a broad ranging discussion. Uh, some of my takeaways, uh, you know, this idea that NGOs that can link their issues to climate change can have a, a huge impact in and have been changing the conversation about climate change is really interesting and how they do that through build, building allies and for, through finding footholds within those negotiations. Um, I'm looking forward to reading your book and, and getting more into those questions. Uh, and then this whole conversation, we've touched on climate and COVID from a number of different perspectives both about how COVID has maybe impacted the movement for addressing climate change and climate justice. Uh, but as you say, these movements are, are creative and uh, we're looking forward to seeing how they, they continue to have their voices heard. Uh, and then also how COVID and post COVID economic recovery is, is tied in with addressing climate and, and other issues. Uh, it's been a really interesting conversation so it's been a real pleasure having you with us today, uh, Jennifer, and I will pass it to uh, to Ryan to uh, take us out. Sure. Well, I also echo my thanks. Um, a quick reminder to our listeners that uh, this podcast is made available under a Creative Commons License 2.0 Canada. So, you know, share it and use it widely. We just ask that you provide an appropriate attribution. Uh, follow us on Twitter at EcopoliticsP with a capital P. Jen, where can people follow you on Twitter? Oh, I'm terribly creative. It's just my name, uh, at Jen Iris Allen. Jen Iris Allen. Okay. Uh, please do get in touch, folks. Uh, our website is ecopoliticspodcast.ca. And the Global Ecopolitics Podcast is produced by Nicole Bedford. Uh, support with transcription and captioning is provided by Kika Mueller. And Adam Gibbard helps us with artistic design and digital support. See you all in our next episode. Stay tuned. Stay tuned.